Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that for revelation knowledge that will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me, all of you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Well, God bless you and welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Tonight I'm going to begin to teach on uh, something I believe will help us. We're going to talk about how to deal with the death of a loved one. In other words, I want to make it as simple and as practical as I possibly can so that you can use this even in your future. Uh, I'm sure all of us at some time in our life have uh, had to go through the death of a loved one. And we need to know what the Bible has to say about it. Because if you don't know what the Bible has to say about it, you will begin to sorrow as those who have no hope. But if you do know what the Bible says about it, then you'll be able to walk in the, in the revelation of what God wants you to see. And so uh, I want to start off with something here that'll, that'll really bless you. If you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I want you to listen to me very carefully as, as I hopefully can provoke some thought in you tonight. You know, the death of a loved one, it, it, it's heartbreaking. And I want to be as compassionate as I can possibly be tonight as I teach this. And each bereavement has its special set of sorrows and, and other strong emotions that are associated with it. There is sorrow that comes suddenly and shockingly with an unexpected death. And there's a long sorrow of gradually losing someone during a terminal illness. And then there's the untimely death of a child, which is especially devastating. Now consider a man and a woman who have had a long and loving marriage. And as God told Adam and Eve, they have become one flesh. Now when one dies, the surviving spouse usually feels forsaken, and empty and lonely and, and torn in two. And of course, the similar feelings are, 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 are appear when anyone dies in your life, of course that. But when you love someone, you become vulnerable to sorrow. And that comes from losing that person. But love is all important. And God doesn't want us to hold back on loving people to avoid uh, future grief in our life. The Bible also makes it clear that our grief will be temporary while our joy will be forever. And the Bible gives us hope of an amazing future when we, will when we will be reunited with our loved ones again. So let's deal with the first issue. What about the comfort? Does the Bible offer comfort? How do I find hope and how do I find comfort at the death of a loved one? So I want to go straight to this most, to I believe the most comforting scripture in all the Bible. And that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. And as I read this, the, to me, this is the, the most comforting scripture. Verse 13 says, but I would not have you to be ignorant or not knowing, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, underline that word asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, here it is again, which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout or a command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And he says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So this is a very comforting thing to know that there appears to be something that happens even after death. 
So the primary way the Bible portrays death is what we see in this word asleep. Look with me at John chapter 11, with me in John chapter 11, verse 11. The primary way that the Bible portrays death is found here in John chapter 11, 11. He says, and he said to them, our friend Lazarus, watch this, sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Look at that again. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, and he's talking about the sleep of death, but I go that I may wake him up. So John goes on to relate how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead to life, you know, through, through the rest of the verses down to verse 45. But in the Bible, death is often referred to as sleep, which is a total lack of consciousness. In fact, look at uh, Psalms 13 and, and verse 3. The Bible often refers to uh, death as sleep, a total lack of consciousness. Look at this in Psalms 13 and 3. He says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest I sleep the sleep of death. Now, the beautiful metaphor of sleep emphasizes the fact that the first death is temporary and that everyone who dies will be awakened. And so that's why this metaphor, sleep, is used. It's, it's to give us this indication that, you know, if the Bible say, calls death sleep, he also says you can be awakened. Glory be to God. You know, those who sleep can be awakened. And this is why he chooses to use this metaphor for death. This understanding of death is much more comforting than all of the erroneous, unbiblical ideas about death that we've probably heard in our past. When someone dies, family and friends often suffer with regret and feelings of guilt about things that they had said or done or things they neglected to say or to do. But God doesn't want us to, to beat ourselves up about the past. He wants us to repent of our sins and to look forward to our reunion in the next life when we will have plenty of opportunity to talk with our loved ones because please understand that when he says to die means to fall asleep and to fall asleep means you can be awakened. So there's going to be a time where everybody's going to be awakened. Those who are in Christ will be awakened to the first resurrection and then everybody else will be awake, awakened to the second resurrection. So how does the Bible then betray, uh, portray death as an, a, 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 and, and, and what, do we, what do we find out? What does the Bible have to say about death? Now, as far as I can understand, death is portrayed as an enemy in the Bible. In fact, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 22 and 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 26. The Bible portrays death as an enemy. Verse 22 says it like this. He says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now look at verse uh, 26. He says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed, look what he says, is death. So death is portrayed as an enemy, and he says it will be destroyed. Now, the Bible portrays death as our enemy, but after the return of Christ, death will be swallowed up in victory. Do you know that scripture? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 54. Death will be swallowed up in victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, talking about the death and the dead body, and the mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, here it goes, death is swallowed up in victory. So there's a truth that we can live by, and there's a truth that we can stand upon and look forward to. A person who is close to God, now please listen to this because you know, I, I said something a couple of weeks ago. I, in fact, I counted twice when I said it out of my mouth. 
And, and, and I, didn't, I needed a better way to say that. You know, I was, I was saying to Taffy, you know, I'm really looking forward to dying. But what I really meant was I'm really looking forward to putting on my spiritual body in God's kingdom. And one of the things I recognize in Scripture is that a person who is close to God can in one sense look forward to death just as Paul did. Uh, you're saying looking forward to death? Well, like I said, most, most, more likely you're looking forward to putting on your new spiritual body in God's kingdom. But, but Paul really looked forward to this. Is it possible that, that there, there are some people you know who are so close to God, they look forward to it? And in Philippians chapter 1, I'm going to read this in the NLT. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 24 in the NLT. Look at and listen to Paul as he struggles with whether to stay here or not. In verse 21, he says, For to me, living means living for Christ. He says, But to me, and dying is even better. What? That, that's somebody that knows God. In verse 22, he says, But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. Next verse. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Are you kidding me? I mean, you know, everybody I ever met was, I mean, nobody, I never heard anybody say they, they were longing to be with Christ. But when you establish a personal relationship with God and you spend time with him and you, you know his goodness and you know his love and, and every day is another adventure with God, you can be like the Apostle Paul. What he or she is really looking forward to is not death itself, but it's, it's waking up with a new body in God's kingdom. And that's what I look forward to, waking up in a new body in God's kingdom. So what about grieving over death? What about how do you handle the grief that comes over you at the death of a loved one? Well, let me, let me show you two scriptures. Write these down, and if you don't get them, you can hear this over again. Matthew chapter 5 and 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who fall asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. You know what he says? Don't be ignorant. Ignorant of what? Don't be ignorant of one of the things, you know, some of the things I'm teaching you right now. Don't be ignorant that when a person falls asleep, he can be awakened. Don't be ignorant of all of the promises that God made concerning life after death. He says, because if you're ignorant of this, then you will sorrow as others who have no hope. Which is one of the reasons I'm teaching this tonight, because there's so many people who are ignorant of this issue in the subject of death, that they have no choice but to sorrow as those who have no hope. You know, it's normal and healthy to grieve when we lose the companionship of a loved one. Those who repress grief rather than expressing it, they suffer more emotional problems in the long run. But healthy grieving, yo, you heard me right, healthy grieving depends on facing the reality of death. You know, in today's humanistic society, in today's humanistic culture, uh, that is a culture that's obsessed with prolonging human life and many people avoiding preparing for death or even discussing the topic, feeling it's so taboo to even say the word died, People will use uh, euphemisms like they pass, and that's no problem. But here's what I want you, to, want you to understand. Denying death makes it harder for people to grieve and support one another and to heal. And so we no longer have to hide behind euphemisms. It's one of the things that will happen. We don't deny it. Uh, it it'll, it'll affect how we grieve. It'll affect how we heal. In a sense, I'm telling people it's okay to sit in the pain around others who are sitting in the same pain so you can heal properly. You know, those who truly understand the Bible feel and they express grief, not fear and not despair, 
but their hope and faith gives them great comfort. And the Apostle Paul, right after explaining about the promise of the resurrection, he said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. So during a time of grief, please, please, please make sure you avoid these two common serious mistakes. Number one, don't try to mask your pain by getting drunk or some kind of drug abuse. Don't try to drown your sorrows with addictive behavior. And then number two, don't neglect to sleep and have good nutrition because, you know, getting sick is only going to uh, greatly add to the stress that you already have, okay? So let's look at the, the next thing here. Is it okay to reminisce when somebody, when, when a loved one dies, is it, is it okay to cry? when a loved one dies? Is it okay to laugh when a loved one dies? Well, look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 15. Romans chapter 12 and verse 15. Verse 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. John 11 tells us the story of Lazarus' death and resurrection. And notice that not only did Jesus not criticize the family and the friends of Lazarus who were weeping, John eleven thirty five 35 records that he wept. The Bible teaches us to sympathize and empathize with others who are grieving. After someone's death, it is important for the loved ones and the friends to, to spend time together and, and, and to reminisce and, and to talk about their precious memories and, and memories that bring forth warm reflection, tears, and laughter. When someone walk, uh, uh, when, when somebody walks in and, and you're, you're going through this situation, one of the things that I would advise is that you have the depth of the loved one, get, get each, each, each family member or friend, bring the pictures that you have and put all those pictures on the table and sit down and look at the pictures and reminisce over what you see. And it may bring some tears and it may bring, bring crying, but that's good. That's something, reminiscing is something that uh, should take place in your life. I highly, highly recommend that. Sometimes people don't know what to do, but to cry all the time. Get, get the photographs. I mean, you have so many of them. Spread them out on the table. And doing the repass or something or the gathering of the family, sit there, look at the pictures, laugh at the pictures, rejoice, let it remind you. That's an excellent thing to do to cause that healing process to begin to take place. Well, but how do our trials and sorrows prepare us to help other people, especially our children? I mean, how, 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 how am I going through this can see that I'm now going to be prepared to help other people or to help my own children. I remember when my father died, it certainly when things that happened at that particular time in my life prepared me to even help other people. Second Corinthians, let me show you something here real quick. Verses 1 through 3, here's what he says, 2 Corinthians 1 through 3. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 4, and here's what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So our trials benefit us if we learn compassion for others. And the comfort we receive should teach us how to give comfort to others. We especially must not overlook the needs, listen to this, of our children. We shouldn't try to hide death from our children. After the death of a loved one, they often don't know what to think. They don't know what to say. Uh, they don't know what questions to ask. They don't know how to express their emotions. They need to understand. They need comfort. They need reassurance 
and they need to feel uh, to be filled with love and security and hope and they need to be with the family and they need to be, sh be uh, involved in the sharing in those discussions. They need to be involved in that grieving and that healing process as well. So, so very important and so vital. And I think a lot of times we just want to throw the kids in a room and not let them be a part of it. And that's not probably not the best thing to do. First John chapter 3, uh, 16 and verse 18. I'm going to read this out of the Good News tr uh, Translation. 1 John 3, verse 16 and 18 out of the Good News Translation. He says, this is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. We too then ought to give our lives for others. My children, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. Now, words of comfort have a very powerful healing effect, absolutely. But more than words is needed. Remember that that family of someone who has just died, they're faced with a whole lot of decisions, a lot of arrangements that need to be made, and plus their daily chores, chores that need to take place. It's frustrating, it's depressing to, to lose a loved one, and, and, and you hardly have time to even think because you're frantically rushing around <clears throat> from one responsibility to the next. And so it can be very helpful to offer specific help to families in mourning. Specific things. I could pick the kids up for you for the rest of the week. Uh, I'll, I'll take care of the cooking for you for the rest of the week. I'll do, the, the words are important, but if you can get in there and help relieve some of the, the duties and things of the normal day life while they're going through that, that's a pretty powerful thing. And if you're in mourning, listen to this, be willing to be, to gratefully accept uh, the help that other people offer you. Sometimes people, you know, they, they're a little bit, you know, you know, too humble or something. I don't know what it is. It's probably not real humility. But when people want to help you in that particular time, be, be gracious. Accept the help. Somebody wants to do your, oh, no, you ain't got to do it. No, do it. You got a, a million things to talk about because when people are around and they love you, let them love you. Let them and receive that. That's so, so very, 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 very important. Now, I want to show you a scripture because this scripture really kind of uh, caused me to pause a little bit in my thinking. But I believe that when you experience the death of a loved one, you need to hear this. And it's the lesson that you can learn from life losses and sorrows. Lessons to be learned during the midst of this, this loss or this sorrow or this, the death of a loved one. I'm going to read out of the NIV version, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verses 2 through 4. And after all, if, if I'm not showing you the answers from the Word of God, then what good is it? We've been bombarded with a lot of opinions of people, but I'm, I'm showing you directly what the Word says. Now listen to this. This is kind of interesting, so it's going to probably do to you what it did to me. It, he says, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. See, that was freaking me out when I read that. I'm like, what? He says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. All right, so now listen to this. Everyone needs time to laugh. Everyone needs time to dance. But we also need time to weep and mourn, according to Ecclesiastes 3 and 4. There's a time for weeping and mourning. Now, spiritual growth takes place more in difficult times than in easy times. And when a loved one dies, it's a valuable time to reflect upon your own life, your own mortality, a time to reflect upon your own relationship with God. You know, it has been said that an open casket is, uh, can be worth a thousand sermons. Some people avoid funerals. They avoid visiting people uh, in hospitals. They avoid visiting people in nursing homes because those situations make them feel uncomfortable. It makes them feel unhappy. But to be a healer, you must go where people are hurting. 
And if you do, your unselfishness will help you mature and grow. And that's why this scripture says it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting because you'll grow more in that house of mourning than you will in that house of feasting. So then, what's the greatest source of understanding and comfort during this time? During this time, what is the greatest source of understanding and comfort? And I can tell you right away, I'll show you scripture, but God is the greatest source. He's the greatest source that you can ever have. In Psalms 147 and 3, Psalms 147 and 3, the Bible says that God heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. In Romans chapter 15 and 4, he says, for everything, for, for, excuse me, uh, verse 4 says, for, for what, whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures, we might have hope. God is our source, ladies and gentlemen. God is that source for understanding and comfort. Our creator, he knows our hearts and he always knows best how to help us. And all the answers to life's questions are in his word. And when we are grief stricken, if we will talk to God and if we'll read his word, we will experience great comfort, great hope, and great healing. Prayer and the Bible. Prayer and studying the Word are those two things that we need to do every day of our lives. So here's the last issue I want you to think about, and I'll give you some practical things that you can do as well. What about the suffering and the sorrow? Is there an end to it? Yes, it is. Ultimately, there's a, a big end to it. Uh, in Revelation chapter 21 and 4 says this, <clears throat> He says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And so not only will families be reunited, but we'll all be in one big happy family, the family of God. And that family will live forever with no more death, no more sorrow, and no more crying. Now, there's some practical things that, that I want to share with you real quick because, you know, if you've ever experienced the death of a loved one, you know, I, I, giving a list of things will, will really help you out. And these are 12 things that I believe you can apply to your life really, really quick. Uh, when you experience the death of a loved one. Number one, realize that everyone deals with death differently. Realize that everyone deals with death differently. Number two, open up and talk about it, but only when you're ready. Open up and talk about it, but only when you are ready. Number three, let yourself be vulnerable it's okay. Let yourself be vulnerable at this particular time. Number four, allow your friends to be there for you. That's really big. Allow your friends to be there for you. Number five, realize and know that you're allowed to be messed up. You know, somebody, well, why are you doing all that? You're allowed to be messed up. You're allowed to, to freak out. And, and, and it's okay. Allow yourself that time. Number six, don't mask the pain. It only pushes back the healing process. Don't mask the pain. Again, it's go and get drunk to try to mask the pain. Uh, using drugs to try to mask the pain. Don't mask the pain. It only pushes back the healing process. Number seven, maybe go someplace you've never been before. Why would I even say that? So that you can see, I mean, this, this, I did this. You can see that life go, is still going on and that you need to, to go on too. Uh, that time when my father died, I, I, I immediately went out of town. 
Uh, I was doing what, what I loved to do, what I wanted to do. And it said to me that, you know, he's dead, but life goes on. He's asleep, God will wake him up later, but life goes on. Number eight, I believe this is, do what you love to do. You know what you love to do before they die, so do what you love to do. Number nine, cherish the memories of your loved ones. Cherish those memories. Don't, don't hide behind things. Cherish those memories. All right? Number 10, give yourself time to heal. Give yourself time to heal. Go to bed, get up, do what you got to do. Go back to bed, get up, do what you got to do. Number 11, one day at a time. I had to take it one day at a time. Make it through this day, make it through the next day, one day at a time. And number 12, I want to keep it, I want to put it like this, keep it moving. Just keep it moving. You can do all those things, but you just keep it moving. And I think that's a key thing to just keep it moving. And when you do that, you allow yourself to heal. You allow yourself to go on with the great hope that those who sleep in Christ and those who fall asleep, the sleep of death, they will be awakened. Father, we thank you for this night. I pray that this has been practical enough so that people who have experienced the death of a loved one, well, maybe some of these scriptures and, and some of this information will allow them to just pick up the pieces and go forward. Oh, while we so love anyone and everyone who's gone through the death of a loved one, we also pray that they can rise above that hurt and that pain and that they don't ignore death, but they allow the healing process to take place, surrounded by people who love them and they love, uh, they love those people as well. So we pray for those who are tuning in to this teaching tonight. We bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. You know, if you're here and you've not been born again, don't wait until it's too late. You don't want to wait to die before you make a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You don't want to do that. You can make a decision right now tonight to give your heart to Jesus Christ and be ready to die. Make a decision tonight, not only to give your heart to Jesus, but to, to grow such a relationship with him that you will be like Paul looking forward to waking up in a new spirit body in God's kingdom. If that's you, repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner, but right now I repent of all my sins. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart. Save me, Jesus. And so right now I believe that I'm saved. And I thank you for being my Savior. Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, uh, text the keyword, I'm saved. That's one word to 51555. Provide your name and your email address. And we'll send you a free ebook as a free gift to you today. Welcome to the kingdom of God. And uh, whether you know it or not, you are prepared to die at any time. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Well, Let's uh, complete our worship tonight as we bring our gifts before God and as we give before Him. And uh, in this series of understanding series, I'll, I'll be doing teachings like, you know, this one tonight, like understanding water baptism, understanding the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, teachings like uh, before I say I do and enter into a marriage that you're not, you know, prepared for. We think that it's time to give some really practical things so that we can make them available for you so that when certain real life situations happen in life, you'll have uh, access uh, to some simple, practical uh, teachings on life's circumstances and situations. And so we hope that that will bless you. Taffy will be in, joining me in some of these teachings because right now relationships are being hammered. 
And um, we believe we have something simple and practical that if you'll do it, you'll see the power of simplicity show up in your life and remove burdens and destroy yokes. So at this time, let's uh, prepare our gifts uh, to give before God in thanksgiving for what he's already given to us. Isn't it awesome that I'm already blessed? I woke up this morning blessed. I woke up this morning healed, delivered. I woke up this morning having access to all the finished works of Jesus Christ. So my giving is the giving of gratitude and thanksgiving for what God has already done. If you're giving through the text tonight, you can text World Changers space and then the amount to 74483. If you are going to call and would like to use the phone to get some help there on the phone in which you're giving, you can call 1-866-477-7683. You can mail, of course, to, to 2500 Burdett Road, College Park, Georgia. Or if you'd like to give online, you can go to worldchangers.org or creflodollarministries.org. And there you can also use your PayPal if you're watching from overseas or, or even if here, you have one here in the United States. We are so thankful and grateful that we have a church that understands, that we have partners that understands the power of giving gifts as a worship to God Almighty, and it's a blessing. And so tonight I'm also rejoicing that we have a church that understands how to handle the death of a loved one. All is well, but please understand this, the greatest thing you can do in life is to develop an intimate relationship with God so that you're like always so excited about the day where you will wake up with a brand new spiritual body in the kingdom of God. What a blessing of the Lord. I mean, to read that Paul had that, it, it, it should have blown your mind. Like, wow, there actually are people who know God and, and love God so much that they're excited about waking up in heaven? Yeah, man. And I pray that same desire comes on the inside of you. Well, hey, guys, we love you so much. Thank you, Wednesday night crew and, and, and all of our friends for joining us for this Bible study tonight. Don't forget to join me tomorrow and for Friday for our morning confessions. And uh, this weekend, we'll continue on our series of understanding um, idolatry and how to overcome it. And so it's a blessing of the Lord. I pray that you will continue to grow in the things of God and become more and more excited about learning and understanding who you are in Christ Jesus. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. And everybody said, amen. Good night, everybody. God bless you.